Hello and welcome to the Car Care Not Shop and welcome to this 2010 Toyota Tundra which came in the shop with a very interesting problem. What is more interesting is a few shops before we got it, we spent the time with it, kept throwing parts at the symptoms and they went through the same part over and over and over and in this video, I want to discuss with you the importance of diagnosis. When something is not going and you keep going through the same issue, you got to stop and regroup and look into really what's going on. Let's get started. We'll talk about what the problem is. We'll show you what we found and what we did and how this thing is fixed. And we actually have one more thing with this car, which we might end up fixing live here on video. So here is the problem with this car. When this car first came into the shop, the owner told me this, the car cranks on its own. And that's usually a giant red flag. It's like, what do you mean it cranks on its own? Literally, you start the car, starts perfectly fine. As soon as you take it out of park, the starter engages with the engine running. And usually stuff like this is pretty simple to find on any car but the Tundra and certain few models. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The Tundra, in case you're not aware, 2007 all the way to 2021, they have a very cool feature, a very unnecessary feature, but it had so much complication. That feature is one click start. So because this engine was really they designed with smart key in mind. The way the ignition circuit works is you bump the key once and let it go. The computer will actually take over the cranking, crank the engine as soon as it starts, it'll disengage the starter, and now the car is running. Sounds like a great feature, except when things go south, which they did here. So here is what's going on with this car. We got the car in, and, and I'm just looking around, this is what I see. This is of course cut, that is not the problem. The connector for the engine computer looks like this. All open, these are broken, things are all mangled up and taped up and somebody's been here just butchered this basically. And the way this happens is Supposed diagnosis. Folks, when you do diagnosis on wiring, you cannot butcher the wires. You have to be careful. Now, this is where things got very interesting. I felt like we were chasing three problems at the same time. The first one was, why is the engine cranking when you're off park and neutral? And then the second one is, there is a series of random codes. So it's like, I don't recall the exact codes, because we looked at this a while back, but the random codes were like, one of them was a fuel pump, which we we're gonna talk about. One of them is air fuel ratios. It almost like codes that the car is not running, but it's running and it's not seeing all the inputs. I hope that makes sense. So here's what, how this kinda came about. You notice this particular wire, a blue wire that has a tape on it. I actually cut that wire. This is the wire that sends a signal to the starter from the computer to keep it engaged until the computer sees high engine RPM that the engine started, then it cuts off the starter and we're good. This is the wire that actually makes that happen. And another wire, which I already cut as well, and that one sends a signal back that the starter has stopped. Something happened with the engine computer where it was not getting that back signal. It's getting it to it, but it's not internally receiving it and it just keeps cranking. And the best part is, for some reason, the same thing that causes computer to go south, it was only not seeing that signal when you're off park and off neutral. Now, of course, this truck have had four starters replaced. It is beyond me why that is the case. I don't understand, okay, you thought there was a starter that was sticking, even though that's not the case, but fine. You put a starter, the next one burned, that's when we stop. That's when we hook up a bulb to see if the starter is getting a signal. No, four starters later. And if you've done a starter in the 5.7, they're not fun. So you're really working too hard here 
Just pull the wire and put a bulb and do your testing. Why are we replacing? Anyways, going back to it. The first problem is the customer brings me the car. This was months ago because we really had a conversation about is this worth it? Because the truck has a lot of miles, it does have rust, does have a lot of other little issues, but the car, the owner is the original owner. This is their work truck. That's why it is not a pristine garage kept. It's a work truck and they really use it as a work truck. So the conversation with them initially was, is this worth it? But he's, he says, in the meantime, while I am thinking about this, if this is worth it, how can I drive my car? Like this, I use it for my company and we don't have another truck, we need it. So what I did, I told him, the truck in Gillette will stay on permanently because now the computer will enter a state where it thinks the engine is cranking because it never received a signal, but it can't send a signal to keep it. So you have to hold the, the key, just like olden times, to start it. And then the truck engine light will be on, but the truck will run fine. And that's what I did actually at the time. I um, cut this one wire, taped it up, and the truck started. And it was no longer cranking the starter every time you get it off park and neutral. The customer took the car because here's what I actually found at the time. So the original problem was an engine computer. They are not common on Toyotas, and this is potentially why the original mechanics couldn't figure this out, but they're not common. But this wire was getting signal to start to crank the starter every time you put it off park or off neutral. And that's the problem because they replace the neutral safety switch. That really have nothing to do. It doesn't even send a signal anywhere to the computer. That only has to do with the starting circuit. That's it. We spent actually a considerable amount of time to figure this exact part out because we're now customizing the, the truck to get it to work for the customer, letting them know that this is a temporary fix. This is kind of a patch for you just to use the truck because I sympathize with their situation because they need this truck for work. Now, here's the second problem. While we were, not we, while the previous mechanics, God bless them, and they were trying, they were probably pulling their hairs out. I can imagine four starters on this in a matter of a couple of weeks. That's not good business. While they were testing, even though, I will say this, you notice that the wire I cut for that start feature that is cool, is not actually on this connector, which this is a top connector for the engine computer. It's actually on this one, which happens to sit on the fuse block right here. Even though it was there and this looked like it was untouched, everything is good here, nothing was touched here. That means they were not working with the wiring diagram, or at least they were, but they were not understanding how things were going. They completely and absolutely butchered the entire wire harness, not just here. Now, this is a small section of the harness. There was cuts on that side. They literally completely butchered this wire harness. Can we fix it? That was the first question that the customer asked me. I told him this, can I fix it? Yes. Is it a good idea? No because I will have to remove this harness out of the car, put it on a table, and as you can see, that did not happen. Put it on a table and then go wire by wire, and I will charge you six times more in labor than what this harness is worth. That's the bottom line. Some folks will say, well, why couldn't we fix it instead of replace it? But folks, that's the problem with, with the current times labor charge. Shops are extremely expensive to open. I, I will fully admit it. When I opened my shop, I did not understand why do labor cost this much. And I set a number. We did a little study for the area and we set a number. But now I understand how that number came about because the costs of running a shop from everything from the simple thing is bills all the way to personnel, phone system, internet, and everything in between, and all the recycling stuff and the EPA stuff. And every day there's an expense that you just didn't know existed yesterday that comes up. So labor cost. If I charge my customer 20 hours, which I will sit on this harness, if I sit on this harness for four or five days, a whole week, basically, 
I will get it fixed and I will be very, very happy and very accomplished and will probably make a very nice YouTube video. But then what does that do to my customer? When I charge them more to look like a hero, fix this harness, then put a brand new one that comes with a warranty. That's where we're at. And unfortunately, I feel really bad about this because this harness was perfectly fine until somebody went and butchered the whole thing to do diagnosis. That is really bad. When you do diagnosis on wiring, you gotta be gentle, especially the tiny little wires. And this Tundra, I always warn you about this in every video we talk about this engine, the three you are, I always tell you the, the starting circuit is very delicate on this engine because they have tiny little wires that are involved in it. And you can't be pulling and poking at these wires and you just can't do that. They actually put pins this way to test and they, oh, I found multiple of these pins, these tiny little pins stretched all the way open where they were no longer making contact. When I see this, it's done at this point. So this truck, actually, we're not 100% done with it. There are a few things that I'm still trying to undo some damage, previous damage, but we had to replace the engine computer, which was the original problem. Then the wire harness, which kind of was a byproduct of diagnosis. Folks, when you work on wiring, you gotta be gentle because these things, this, this harness, I think was $1,400. Well, these things are not cheap, especially on Toyotas. They're super expensive because they're very well made. They usually will never have issues with wiring unless there's rodent damage or uncareful folks trying to diagnose problems. This is why this car got the harness because it was just beyond repair at this point or beyond reasonable repair because I'm not gonna spend more than $1,400 in labor to fix it than to replace it. That just doesn't make sense. I hope that makes sense because there's stuff broken. This connector, you cannot get it separate. This is broken. This is a very important connector that goes straight on the ECU. This thing is missing the lock in its entirety. Then come the uh, surprise of the century, at least to me. This was something that initially I was geared up for heavy diag because all the codes were gone. Truck runs perfectly fine. And then we end up with a code for the fuel pump. This has a code, had a code, for a fuel pump switching valve. I'll put that code right here. So what that valve does, it switches the fuel pump from nine volts to 12 volts. That's the high pressure, low pressure. This is something with these Tundras as well. Now this one is a flex fuel one as well. So it had a code for that being open. And I look at the diagram, like, all right, we, we kind of have an idea what's going on. So I'll put that diagram up here. The EFI relay feeds the fuel pump VSP. VSV is vacuum switching valve. I don't know why they use that term. There's actually not a vacuum switching valve, but that controls the valve. Turns it on, turns it off. It was open. So basically when, when it's open, that means the wire is just completely open and there's no nothing making it there. There's super high resistance. That's what that means. So I come here, fuse is fine. If I relay, of course, is fine because the engine runs. I look at the diagram for the fuses and I'll put that on the picture here. You see how the fuel pump and the fuel pump VSV relays are staggered. When I look at the fuse block, they were not staggered. So, hmm. What do we have here? Actually, whoever was working on this car during their, I don't know what they were doing, God bless them. I mean, they obviously tried because this truck was in their shop for a very long time. They put the relay backwards and it was not even plugged in. And I don't want to say this, but I have a feeling that did did this entire problem start with here? Because I see other stuff that we're going to talk about here that are just completely wrong with this truck. Anyways, I just couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. I just look at this, I'm like, I was gearing up for a giant fight knowing how this harness was handled or mishandled. I was gearing up for a giant fight. I'm like, I'm already thinking, I hope this fuel tank comes down so we can test the wiring going front to back, whatnot. I look at this relay, I'm like, no, it can't be that. I, I was just like laughing, I'm like, Really? And then I found another relay right next to it for the tow haul. 
mode was also the same way put upside down in the wrong spot and it was basically not not connected to anything i put the release relays back and would you believe it code is gone things are working do a little test active test everything works fine and this truck now is fine we're actually keeping it i do have a few brackets that were mangled i want to work on them a little bit to get them nicer and there's a couple things we're going to address actually in this video here live we'll look at them minor stuff but i want to drive this truck until it's because the biggest problem with this truck is it's coming up on a mission test and you obviously you couldn't pass the missions before so we want to drive it until it's ready for missions pass the missions mission station is just down the street from us to give the customer a little bit of an extra assurance that, hey, you passed your missions, truck is good, because they really, at this point, and I don't blame them, they really have no faith in any mechanic. I, I get it, I get it. I mean, you've spent so much money, so much time, and this is your work truck, and it's still down. And it still has a problem that is catastrophic. You turn the key, you, you start your truck, you put it out of park, it cranks the starter and almost burns it up that's dangerous i'm glad nothing else got damaged here but going back to the original problem i want to show you one thing do you see this harness watch this and grab a wire i'm gonna pull on it that's it that's how delicate this harness is folks i'm not putting a lot of force these tiny little wires all all it takes for you to just be a little bit belligerent and they're broken that's all it takes folks you see how simple that is? Now, when you get into the heavier wires, that's not the case. Like you get into something on the other side, like this one. I hope you can see it clearly. This is a much thicker wire. But even that, sometimes, see this one I can't pull. This one is strong. You can't pull that. But these tiny wires, I can pull these all day long. There you go. Broken. So if you're being uneasy about it, that's all it takes. That's why I wanted to see, I want you to see this so you are careful when you see little wires like this. Don't be pulling on them because they, it doesn't take much for them to break. So here's what we got with this truck. There's a couple things in addition to the main thing. Horn doesn't work. And <laughs> well, there's a good story for that one. And then the wireless lock unlock remotes don't work. We're gonna look at that last, but let's look into the horn. And the first giant red flag that I see is why is there a little wire? And if I chase this wire down all the way to here, I see a giant disaster. Do you see that uh, connector all the way down there? And try to light it up a little better. See that connector? How it's uh, sticking out? It's because of this little wire sticking through it, that black wire. Let me move it and you'll see it. See that wire? That is a disaster waiting to happen, my friends, because that is wide open to the inside. Basically, any water you put there goes right inside. That's not good. We did all that for this wire that goes straight to one of the two horns. I mean, I guess they are connected, the positive. So the way horns work on Toyotas, and I think all cars, ground through the body, power here, you get power. This is actually one wire that splits into two. So if you power one of them, the other one powers up. Here's what the previous mechanic did. Instead of figuring out what's actually wrong with it, well, I'm just going to run this wire, leave that wide open to, for water to go in, and we're going to put a switch right on the dash. Drill a hole and put a switch with the switch broke, and now we have no horn. So this doesn't work and this wire i don't even know where it's powered from hopefully from somewhere safe so that's what we're going to investigate now here is here is my hunch working on these trucks knowing them and their quirks i have a hunch that what we're actually going to find out is the spiral cable is the problem i could be wrong but we're going to find out so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to get this column cover off. I might actually remove this as well because I want to see what exactly they do with that switch. Did they chop up more wires here and make a giant mess or are we good? Let's pop these covers and we'll find out. Okay, let's see what surprises lie here. Just unlock the steering. That's another thing I don't like. 
See how that's not always recognizing the key? Let's see what we find here. Is this one is the type that has bolts at the bottom. No. Two types of these. Really oh, this one is. I have a feeling this has been apart before. Why aren't you coming out? I already see you. Can we just uh, stop this video right here and say one thing? Whenever you see this, this little ugly thing, that is the worst thing you will ever see on any car. This is a horrible idea. This is, sorry to say this, if you are the manufacturer of this or you do some aftermarket accessory and use this, this tells me what this statement, what this states to me is, I am being lazy. That's, that's what I take from that. Sorry if you use those. I mean, some have used them, never had issues. I really dislike these. They are a disaster waiting to happen. Now, we got this far. We got that out of our chest. Uh, let me see. I'm going to pull the diagram for you guys to see what I'm actually looking for. Which I cannot find. Hmm. Looking for a brown wire, which I don't see. And that is a really bad idea. Am I looking at the right connector here? I don't think I am. Okay, I am not, I think. Yes, there it is. So this little brown wire right here. I need to run to my diagram to verify, but I'm pretty sure it is this one is the horn signal. So technically, looking at this diagram, if I give that wire ground, we should have a horn. Let me just double verify that this is actually the connector that we need to look at, and I'll be right back. So now that I found my connector, which is actually, it was not the pin that I was talking about, it was this one which is not doing anything. Hmm. So if I put ground here, the horn should sound. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a horn. But just to make sure we were making good contact to this pin, I'm gonna use a T-pin, go on the back gently. Just like that. And then this, this logic probe, by the way, the power probe is one of the best tools for diagnosis. It has a voltmeter built into it, and this wire actually supplies ground all the time. So now I put ground on the pin, and I see that ground here. Yes, we were making good contact. So, problem is actually not the spiral cable. See, I should have known better with this car. The only thing I'm going to look at is, do we have something damaged in this wiring? Which does not seem to be the case. I mean, I see a lot of aftermarket wiring all over the place. But I don't see something wrong, per se, with this wire. I just wonder, what did they do here? They ran a wire direct. I mean, you could have done this a little cleaner, where it hooks on, for example, to this wire. And that's how you do the, the horn. Or wire a little relay, which is actually what we're, we might end up doing, if we find something big. But we're not going to give up yet. We're going to go and check under the hood. Let's go check it out. that out. Because here's how this, I'm going to pull that diagram again here. Do you see that gray box? That's actually inside the fuse block. So I'm going to start investigating there because that relay is not a pullable relay. It's part of the fuse block. So let's go check that and see what we find. Since we are here, I'm just going to check the power fuse. I doubt it. This is the horn fuse. I'll just double check that it is. Yes, it is. Huh. That is nothing. I wonder if that fuse is blown. Mm, no, it's not blown. It's just, look at that. This is what I tell you. Somebody's been here. They were very rough with these fuses. It's like, why do you use pliers to pull a fuse when you have the puller right next to you? That's okay. Let's check inside got power on one side 
nothing on the other side. It's a little bit of a concern because we should we should see ground, which is kind of starting to tell me what's going on here. So I'm going to substitute that fuse just to make sure we were. This is a five amp fuse. Originally, it's a 10 amp circuit. You can go lower. I blow the fuse early, but for testing purposes, we're just going to use this one. Never go a higher fuse when you're testing, though. Got power. Got power. So here's here's my concern right now. When I pull this fuse, this circuit should complete itself all the way to ground because you have no no power flowing through it so the ground from the horn should follow the wire to go through the relay and be standing here i don't have that here and that's what's concerning me i look in here make sure we don't have any issues no. i have nothing here so i'm gonna do something interesting let me check my diagram again so here's what i'm gonna do I have to go look at the internal diagram, but I have a feeling because the fuse is here, this block, this black block, is actually where the relay is. This is a relay block, like a kind of a built-in relay block, and someone's also been here. Very, very concerning because this relay block is a little bit on the delicate side. Oh yeah, they pried it. You can see the pry mark right here, I'm trying to get it out. I wonder if they broke the tabs that hold it. It's coming out. There it is. Now, relay integration. So this is an integration relay. They still call it, wow, that's from the olden days. So this is gonna take me a minute, but basically what I'm trying to find is the actual wire going out to the horns and we'll test it here. We'll verify if the fuse is here. I'll look at the internal. So they give you an internal diagram of the fuse block we spend some time we'll come back we'll cut you guys that boring looking at a screen time so we can continue our diagnosis and figure out what's going on with this horn circuit so here's what we're gonna do I'll pull that diagram real quick the blue wire which I wrote located to this one this particular one right here this one is the one that goes straight to the horn I'll point out in the diagram here this one as ground so if I put power here the horn should sound hopefully Jose don't freak out because the horn is right underneath you Jose yep that works the wire next to it is the violet wire which is the one I pointed at it in the diagram right here that's what powers the relay now I'm gonna get my t-pin here and I see somebody already been testing here and you didn't have to poke the wire like that but I'm gonna get in here we have power, and this is what is confusing about electrical diagnosis. When you have power, that means the power is running through here and stopping right here. So if I put ground here, I will actually activate the relay. Let's see if the horn sounds when I do that. Yep. So, our relay is good. Our wire going to the horn is good. Violet wire is internally connected. But the question is, am I gonna get ground here when I activate the horn switch. Now I'll, I'll leave this here, sorry for the annoying sound. This should turn into a ground when I hit the switch inside. Nothing. So we have isolated our problem to this wire. Now you see that little junction connector, that's actually inside the fuse block inside the car so at this point we're done here i can plug this actually i'm going to leave it for a bit because we'll run some testing but the problem is in the fuse block i have a feeling so we're going to now test the wire from 
the horn switch to that junction connector that I'm pointing at right here, which is in the fuse block under the hood. Let's, I'll skip over this, we won't film it. I'll just tear a little bit in the car and we'll run some testing and we'll see what we see. Maybe we'll find a broken wire. Maybe it's something inside the fuse block, which at that point, we'll just run a little jumper, bypass it. We don't have to replace a whole fuse block for just this. And I think we're good to go from there. So here's what we have. I'll put that diagram up real quick. Do you see that violet wire? It comes down from the relay. Then it goes into that little box. That little box is actually inside the fuse block. There's two connectors. You look at these little numbers. There's DB and DD. These are actually two separate connectors. So the wire passes through the body ECU. Now connector DD is all the way at the back of the fuse block, which is a little bit harder to get to. So let's start with the easy one, which is right in front of us, which is DB pin number one, violet wire. This is the wire that comes that goes to the relay. When we activate the horn here, it'll actually send ground to energize the relay, which then energizes the horn. So I have my pin on it and I have nothing. That's not a good sign. As you see, 12 volts. Remember when we checked the violet wire under the hood? So just, just for good measure, I'm gonna... I have no horn. But equally, because that wire is also connected to this, if I push this now and touch it, I should see ground. Let's see. I'm not like making good connection on it. Let's see. Yep. So that tells me everything from the spiral cable, the horn pad, the wiring in the steering column, all the way to that is good, even through the fuse block. So the fuse block is not a problem, which leaves us with one problem a single wire, that violet wire that goes from the relay to here, there's a break in it. And to make a long story short, we're gonna bypass it, like basically put a jumper, mimic that wire on the outside and see if we work, and then it's a matter of running a wire. Now I already have that hooked up. This green wire is actually connected to that pin with the violet wire, which is supposed to be the same wire that runs from here, there. I'm gonna connect this to it, and it's connected on the other side. It's connected right here, connected out there. I'm gonna test the horn. Well, that's about it. I think we're done here. So let's go outside the truck and talk about what this actually means. Come on, Jose, let's show them what's going on here. This wire, the violet wire, you see how I have my, my alligator clip here on it? It's broken somewhere from here through the harness, which runs inside the truck to the fuse block. Now there's not a lot of stretch of wire and it could be broken anywhere. Now I see this violet wire, in case you see that, that's actually not it. This looks like a, a wire that broke and they ran a jumper. It actually does not go inside of this. And if anything, it runs in this big harness. I, I want you to see it. This big harness right here, and goes inside. That's all it is, folks, to get this horn to work. So here's what we're gonna do. Obviously, we're not gonna go replace an entire harness because this harness is, no, for not for a single wire, not for something like simple like a horn. So here's what I'm gonna do. I am gonna run a wire from here, tuck it inside the fuse block, have it come out, go properly through that opening, all the way to that violet wire inside, tie up to it, tie up here, and we're done. That's, that's all to fix this horn. Now, all these signs of folks poking around, breaking this, being really ungentle with things that are very delicate, like this integration relay, it was not necessary. All it was was one wire. And I have a feeling some of this, there's a lot of aftermarket stuff inside this truck that just looks very ugly. We're gonna try to tidy some of it up. I'm gonna remove that switch, although I'm gonna leave the switch itself because they cut a hole through the dash and that's kind of not good. But I mean, why couldn't the previous mechanic that did all the work to run this wire all the way inside and drill the dash, which is not nice, and put the switch, why couldn't they, if, if they did all that, why couldn't they just run a wire from here to there? That is beyond me. The horn circuit is one of the simplest circuits. If you want to learn how to diagnose electrical stuff, that is the first circuit you start with. It's one of the most basic. Even in the most 
complicated cars, the horn circuit remains simple. And the reason, just for you to know what's going on, the reason it passes through the fuse block inside the car because it actually branches off on the inside. They don't show you that in the diagram because that's a separate system. It branches off and goes to the body ECU. So when your alarm goes off, they sound the horn that way. It just applies a little ground to that violet wire internally and the horn goes off, the alarm. Now, that function, I do not know if that's working properly. I'm not gonna cut the wires in case it is working properly. It's gonna run through our jumper and it'll work, but we're basically replicating what the original wire is. Now, if we have 10 wires that are broken like that, there is a chance that I will basically tell the customer, in order for me to put my name on this repair, we will need to replace the harness because when I have 10 wires that are cut, I'm gonna to want to find that cut. And if I see signs of corrosion problems, and I'm gonna investigate this wire harness a little bit more off camera, but just to see if we see something obvious, if I see a cut, it's much easier to repair that cut than to run the wire and do it properly. But this was a very simple diagnosis, folks. And I'm gonna hold off on doing the remotes because I wanna tackle this. I wanna take care of this, this customer is very patient with us. He basically also told us, this is kind of my last resort. I'm, after this, I'm just junking the truck, which is honestly, it's not in the greatest shape in the world, but it does have a lot of miles. It is a work truck. It runs and runs pretty good. We actually drove it after we did the wire harness and everything. Drives pretty good. I mean, I think they can get some, some more use out of it. And the horn was something really annoying. They, they drive it in the city of Chicago. And if you live in the, around the city of Chicago, a horn is a really useful thing. Now, one thing, when we, when we were checking the horns, of course, I'm going to remove this wire. I don't like this wire. This horn was not working. So if you have this problem, two things you're going to look at. First, the contact point of the ground, because this bolt's actually that ground. So you're going to take this, clean it up. And the second thing that is super common with Toyota horns is this, if I can get it out. See, this one already is not, not behaving. This gets corroded, and I already see the corrosion. For reasons beyond, I see somebody's been here testing. Don't poke wires to test them, that's such a bad idea. See how it's wide open for corrosion? I mean, these already corrode. For some reason beyond me, Toyota never insulated these. So they always corrode, and you always have problems. If you disconnect a horn from a Toyota, the next time you go plug it in, it won't work. You have to keep cleaning this and cleaning this. So you can replace this. This connector is available, of course. Or you can just use a universal one. It'll fit. It won't look nice and OEM, but it'll work if, you, if you're in a cringe and you don't have one of these. I mean, all this is a glorified one of these. That's all it is. But folks, this is, let me plug this in. Folks, we figured this out. This is very simple. We still have a few odds and ends. Some of the harness, like if you look here, this bracket is not sitting properly and I don't like it. I'm gonna take it off, spend some time. So this connector ends up plugging in here. And then we have a bracket that was missing there. I want to either find one or make one for it that plugs this into here. I don't know where, where was that? That was missing to begin with. And there's a few odds and ends about the harness that I want to spend some time with. I don't like when wires are just sitting there and not plugged in everywhere where they're supposed to. I don't like that. And there is one last thing that I'm very concerned about with this truck, which we're gonna keep it, kind of keep an eye on. When we took the filter out, like the intake here, there was fuel or some kind of fluid inside this box. And the thing is, this vacuum connector, let me see if I see any, see I've been watching, keeping a watch for it. This vacuum connector is connected to the fuel pressure regulator. Now, if you have fuel here, this fuel pressure regulator could be leaking fuel inside this vacuum line, or this is another scenario that is very interesting. Somebody was trying to use starter fluid and filled this up a lot. I haven't seen, since we took it apart, I haven't seen any fuel there, but again, I'm gonna keep an eye on it because if that fuel pressure regulator is leaking fuel like that, this is gonna cause all kinds of issues and we wanna replace it because that's not something we, we caught it already, I don't wanna, so I'm keeping an eye on that. But this truck, we're almost done with it. We're actually, the wire is gonna tie it up possibly tomorrow day after, fix that, run the new wire for the horn.
and see about the remote, so that's probably just programming, and we're good with that. But this truck gets another life, keeps going, does not end up in the junkyard. It's actually a decent work truck, not perfect, but not bad either. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.